Okay, Chiaki, don't panic. I woke up in an unfamiliar bed with a strangely familiar stranger telling me I barely survived death. I've been out for months, and everyone I know thinks I'm dead. Sounds like the prologue of an RPG. Attempting to be serepitous, she stole a glance at Kamakura-kun, who had returned to his seat, trying to get a feel for his character. Long black hair, red eyes that almost seemed to glow, attractive but stoic face. No doubt about it, if this were an RPG, he'd be the aloof, all-knowing, mysterious character, the one your party encountered multiple times but wasn't sure whose side they were on. Like Ash in Tales of the Abyss. What else? He'd said he'd tended to a recovery, so maybe he was a doctor? But he wasn't dressed like one. But if it wasn't his job, why had he looked after her? Eight months was a long time to commit to something like this. He said, he said his, his body, body used to be Hinata-kun's, whatever, whatever that means. means. Maybe, maybe there's something there's left of Hinata-kun in, in there? That was a nice thought, though maybe she was just being wistful. Hinata-kun had been her first friend, her first best friend. He'd been special to her. She didn't want to believe he was completely dead. But was it unfair to think like that? Kamakura-kun had saved her life. He deserved the dignity of being addressed as himself not as a shadow of her best friend. So then, wouldn't using Kamakura-kun but secretly projecting Hinata-kun be rude too? Even in this short interaction, she could clearly see how different they were. Hinata-kun was always so uncertain, anxious even, but he was so alive in comparison to the glacial, formal Kamakura-kun. And he didn't make her feel the same way Hinata-kun had. Talking to him didn't make her feel light and floaty. Her heart hadn't jumped into staccato when their eyes had met. The face was the same, but the differences in expression, in posture, in hair, in eyes were so great. It reminded her of that first thought when she saw him. Even if he was Hinata-kun, he wasn't. Even if Hinata-kun still existed, he wasn't here right now. In the end, there was really only one question that mattered, only one she could answer. Did she believe in Kamakura-kun? Did she believe what he'd told her, and did she believe that he had her best interests at heart? Listening to what her heart was telling her, she quickly found the answer. Okay, I'll hold you to that. He blinked at her. You are not afraid. I just informed you that you are completely defenseless and weak in an unknown location with an unknown man as your only company. No one knows where you are, nor do they believe you to even be alive. Any other in your place would find that a frightening position to be in. Chiaki shook her head. No, if you wanted to hurt me, you've had plenty of time to do it, and more than that... She paused, trying to figure out how to verbalize her thoughts. I just know I can trust you. You know you can trust me. I don't know how to explain it. She pursed her lips. It's like, I know I've felt your presence and heard your voice before. It's safe. If she hadn't been looking at him in that exact instance, she would have missed the fractional widening of his eyes entirely. As is, it was such a small movement she wasn't sure she hadn't imagined it. Such a decision is most illogical. You are indeed a curious person, Nanami Chiaki, he finally said. Well, not everything has to be about logic. The world would be boring if it were, I think. He wanted to test her for any lingering neurological or mental damage immediately, and he tested practically everything. How well she could track him across a room, how far she could see clearly, how much of her past she remembered, how much basic knowledge she had, whether she could feel his hand's grip on her thigh, her knee, her arm. By the end of it, Chiaki was exhausted and ready to go back to sleep, but she tried to keep her eyes open at least long enough to have finished hearing him out. You retain sensation in all your limbs, he surmised as he released her forearm. That is fortuitous. It means you will still be able to use them. It will take time to return them to the shape they used to be in, but a full recovery is not out of the realm of possibility. That's good to know. Though really, I'm just glad my hands are safe. I'd be devastated if I couldn't play my games anymore. What had happened to her games, she wondered with a pang. 
an odd thing to worry about given the circumstances, but they were so important to her. They defined her, like it or not. The thought of her friends slowly boxing them up, thinking she would never need them again, brought a lump to her throat. That risked sending her down a road she didn't particularly want to travel, so she pushed it to the back of her mind to pay attention to what Kamakurakun was currently saying. Mentally, you also appear to be fine. You do not appear to have anterograde amnesia or retrograde amnesia, though further testing will be required to solidify that. All right. Despite her efforts, her mood had swung down a bit, and it must have shown. Kamakura-kun studied her for a long moment, seemingly considering something, then said, There is one more thing. The raven-haired man reached into his pocket and pulled something out. Chiaki blinked. Is that my Gala Omega hairpin? Kamakura-kun's face was completely unreadable as he answered, It fell out of your hair. I predicted you would want it back, so I held on to it. He placed the pin in her hand, and she managed to curl her fingers around it, a bit of happiness flickering back in her chest. She could barely lift her arm, so she wasn't able to wear it, but it was still nice to have it again, nice to have an anchor to her life eight months ago. Ah, you were right. Thank you for that. It was really thoughtful of you. She smiled at him. He looked away. From here on out, I will be tending to your recovery and return to peak health. I predict it will be a long process. I will draw up a rehabilitation program and have it ready by tomorrow. Tomorrow? That seemed awfully quick, and Shiaki wondered yet again just who Kamakura-kun was. But he'd said he'd explain later, so she smiled again and dipped her head gratefully. I'm in your care. End of chapter 4 Author's note. Yes, I know Izuru has the hairpin in canon. Don't worry, I know what I'm doing. All will be explained in time. Reason for the dates. I actually had to go back and edit the amount of time Izuru spent watching over Chiaki because I miscalculated the date of her execution. Whoops. So, here's the fruit of that labor. Chisa's return from the reserve course is in March. Six months before that is September, so that's the month Kameda was suspended in. That's important because Episode 7 has, quote-unquote, the first anniversary of Kameda's death, end quote, or suspension. Episodes 7 through 10 occur very closely to each other within a few days, so Chiaki's execution was in September. Assuming Hope's Peak has the normal term length as a Japanese high school, their graduation date would have been in March, and that would have been when the fall of Hope's Peak happened. So Chiaki spent six months unconscious at the academy, the tragedy happened, and it's been another two. Also, most people wake up without any memory of what put them in the coma in the first place. That's convenient for me, since I don't have to tackle the issue of the failed rescue mission right away. There's already a lot Izuru needs to explain to Chiaki, a lot for her to process, without having to acknowledge the mess that came with that. <laughs>